Hi, I'm Dr Gemma Sharp and in this video I'll be talking about epigenome-wide association studies. So epigenome-wide association studies or EWAS are the most commonly used analysis approach in epigenetic epidemiology. EWASs involve uh, statistical tests being applied to each feature in a genome-wide epigenetic data set to assess the association between epigenetic variation and a trait of interest. So this term EWAS is most commonly used to describe studies of array-based or increasingly uh, genome-wide sequencing-based DNA methylation data sets. So for example, an EWAS of uh, smoking behaviour using the Illumina EPIC array would likely involve running around 800,000 regression analyses, um, although in principle any statistical test could be used, um, and then assessing uh, smoking in relation to DNA methylation at different specific CPG sites measured by the array. So there are uh, four key steps to performing an EWAS, and I'll go through those now. So step one, um, the infinium methylation uh, assay or the Illumina uh, array, um, this is an assay by the biotech company Illumina. It detects cytosine methylation based on genotyping of bisulfite converted genomic DNA. So the first step is to treat the DNA with bisulfite, and this means um, unmethylated cytosine bases are converted to uracil, while methylated cytosine bases remain unchanged. So then the DNA is amplified, basically we make more of it, and this turns the uracils into thiamines, so U's into T's. So what started out as a methylated cytosine stays as a cytosine, but what started out as an unmethylated cytosine becomes a thymine. In this step, the DNA is also split up into smaller fragments uh, by enzymes. Uh, next, we take this DNA and we hybridize it to probes on a chip. We've got hundreds of thousands of probes, and these are basically just small strands of DNA that are complementary to specific sections of DNA across the genome in our sample. And a chip is just a way of running more than one sample at a time. So we can run 12 samples at a time on an, on an Illumina chip. Um, and each well on the chip contains all of the probes. Then we add a fluorescent reagent to the uh, chip. And this labels all C's and G's, but not A's and T's. So cytosines that were methylated in our sample are still cytosines. So they're going to be labeled with a flu fluorescent label. But cytosines that were unmethylated in our original sample are now thiamines, so they're not going to be fluorescently labelled. Then we uh, scan the chip and the ratio of fluorescent signal is compared. And on these type of arrays, uh, DNA methylation is measured as a beta value, which describes the proportion of DNA strands in a sample where a specific CPG is methylated versus uh, unmethylated. So it gives you a value between 0 and 1. So completely unmethylated to completely methylated. So uh, step 2 in running an EWAS, uh, this is a really important part um, of running an EWAS, is preparing the DNA methylation data. Um, and to do that, we pre-process it. So in this step, we take our DNA methylation data and we normalize it. This is necessary because the probes on the array come in two different types, and those two different types can give different results. So we want to bring the data into the same register to make the data from the different probe types directly comparable. We also want to try to correct for batch effects. So some of the probes are known as control probes, which means that they shouldn't really show any variation across samples. So where we do see variation at those probes, we know it's probably due to a technical batch effect and not anything of uh, biological interest. Therefore, we, um, we can use the methylation variation at those probes to attempt to correct for the, the, the array data for any systematic batch effects. Then we can take those control probes out because those aren't going to tell us anything interesting about the biology of our samples. 
we, we might want to uh, remove other probes as well. So for example, some probes um, have been found by other studies to be uh, unreliable. So for example, maybe they're unspecific or non-specific. So they're uh, actually measuring DNA methylation at multiple sites at once instead of the sites that they're supposed to be specific for. Um, probes on the sex chromosomes are also often removed because these, these can give uh, strange readings, particularly um, or partly because uh, DNA methylation is used, used uh, to silence one of the X chromosomes. And finally, we, want, we might want to remove individual values for some probes if they're outliers. So outliers in methylation data are quite common. Um, and they might be driven by rare SNPs, so rare um, uh, differences in, in the underlying DNA, or they might be uh, driven by technical effects. So for example, in this graph here, um, this was using ALSPAC data, and I plotted uh, DNA methylation on the x-axis against birth weight on the y-axis for just one CPG site, so one probe. And you can see that most data points sit around uh, the very low to zero mark, but one person has a much higher methylation value of around 0.7. And um, that uh, blue line is the regression line from an analysis with that person included. And when they are identified as a uh, outlier and, they, and we Windsorize the data, so their value is brought down to the 99th percentile for the rest of the data, we get the green line um, and when they're completely removed we get the red line so you can see that the results are quite different depending on whether we choose to include the outlier or not and the method that we use to deal with the outlier next once we're happy with our dna methylation data we can run an association test so this involves comparing DNA methylation beta values to a phenotype or a trait of interest, uh, usually with adjustment for other covariates. So as an example, we might run an EWAS of smoking, where we uh, run a linear regression model for each CPG on the array, treating methylation as the outcome and smoking as the exposure, with adjustment for sex and age of the participant. Um, other things that we commonly adjust for in EWAS are technical batch. Uh, it's unlikely that all of our batch effects were going to be removed by that pre-processing step we did at the beginning. Um, and we also commonly adjust for set the cellular makeup of our samples. So uh, we can actually estimate the cellular makeup from DNA methylation itself. So in that case, we would first use the methylation data to estimate cell proportions and then include those estimated cell proportions in our EWAS model. Um, another thing to mention is that DNA um, methylation can be the exposure or the outcome in our EWAS model and any type of statistical analysis is possible. So linear regression with methylation as the outcome is the most common, but logistic regression and other types of regression with binary outcomes, um, ordinal outcomes, they're all possible. Um, it depends on the study design and the hypothesis. So we usually use R to run our EOS, and there are many packages that have been written specifically for this purpose. The results of an EOS look a bit like this. So um, these are the results for just three probes, so three CPG sites. Uh, we have the uh, C CPG ID, um, we have the regression coefficient, the standard error for that coefficient, the p-value and the p-value after adjustment for multiple testing. It's really important to adjust p-values for multiple testing because we're carrying out hundreds of thousands of tests. So the Illumina 450K array includes over 450,000 probes and the Illumina EPIC array includes over 800,000. So we're conducting that many uh, statistical tests in our EOS. A proportion of those tests are going to have uh, very low p-values just by chance alone. So that would mean we'd end up incorrectly rejecting the null hypothesis of no association. Correcting for multiple testing therefore helps us to avoid that. So there are two ways that um, are commonly used to adjust EWAS results for multiple testing. 
and those are the Bonferroni approach and the uh, false discovery rate or uh, FDR approach um, and Bonferroni is a bit more stringent than FDR. Uh, next, the regression coefficient. So this can be interpreted in the same way as it would for any other study. So in an EWAS of binary uh, yes, no smoking status with methylation as the outcome, the coefficient would be the difference in mean methylation levels in smokers compared to non-smokers. Uh, if methylation was the exposure and we'd use logistic regression to analyse smoking status as a binary outcome, we can convert the coefficient to an odds ratio and then describe it in terms of the odds of smoking versus not smoking per one unit increase in DNA methylation. Sometimes we might want to set a threshold for what we consider to be a biologically or a clinically important effect size and this can help us narrow down results and avoid focusing on very small effects that might be biologically meaningless uh, despite having small p-values. However, in practice, this is really difficult because we still don't really know what an effect, uh, what size an effect has to be to be biologically meaningful. So um, combined small effects over several CPGs, uh, potentially throughout the genome, could be as important or if not even more important than large effects at individual CPGs. So this is uh, tricky. The next step in running an EWAS is to examine and interpret the results. Um, data visualizations can really help with this. So this is an example of a Manhattan plot, which is called that because it's supposed to look like skyscrapers on a Manhattan skyline. Um, we have minus log 10 p-values for the EWAS results on the y-axis and location on the genome on the x-axis. And each CPG is re represented by a point on the plot. CPGs with uh, small p-values therefore rise to the top, sticking out of the top of the skyline. Um, and we can draw these lines on here to indicate where the different p-value thresholds lie. Another way to visualise EWAS results is using a volcano plot. Um, again, these show minus log 10 p-values on the y-axis, but the x-axis shows regret the regression coefficient, so i.e. the effect estimate. So this plot allows us to visualise p-values and effect estimates simultaneously. Again, the points are CPGs uh, or probes um, and CPGs with large estimates in either direction and small p-values are likely to be of most interest and are highlighted here on this plot. And yet another way to visualise EWAS results is using a quantile-quantile plot or a QQ plot which plots the observed distribution of p-values on the y-axis against the expected distribution of uh, values of p-values under the null hypothesis of no association on the x-axis. Uh, and deviations of CPG sites from the line suggest either true associations or spurious associations due to other factors. Um, the inflation value, uh, the inflation value is called lambda, and this gives an estimate of systematic bias that might need to be corrected for, um, and a value of one would indicate no inflation. So, for example, a high lambda and a QQ plot where the uh, points come away from the null line very early on might indicate residual confounding by large technical batch effects or some other source of confounding that affects uh, associations at a large number of CPGs on the array. The next, uh, the other thing we might want to do is we might be interested in looking at the genes near our top CPGs that we've identified in our EWAS and trying to decipher the biological pathway linking DNA methylation to our trait of interest. And there are many uh, tools available um, online and our packages um, to help us uh, do this so to help investigate the biological significance of EWAS findings and then finally we might also be interested to know whether any of the CPGs that we've identified have been associated with any other traits by previous studies and this uh, might help us to understand how 
different traits are correlated and whether differential methylation at certain CPGs affects or is a marker of multiple traits. One way to do that is to look up identified CPGs from your EUS in a, a repository of previous EUS findings, such as the EUS catalogue, uh, which was developed at the MRC Integrative Epidemiology Unit in Bristol. So if you're interested in finding out more about EWAS and learning about some of the methods and some of the many limitations, uh, these papers are a really good place to start. <laughs>